into our students. The UKZN Student Chapter Committee includes members Bomakazi Ndoloza, Genevieve Padayachi, Sakile Zikali, Salisha Govinder, Vyashan Hariprasad, Zenali Dube, and our member who worked tirelessly to ensure today runs smoothly, Sadna Ramklas. The SAISI Durban branch hosts a range of events throughout the year in which the SAISI Student Chapter Committee actively participates. These events include webinars, charity drives, a range of competitions such as the Build Bridge Building Competition for Scholars, the current Merit Competition, amongst many others. For more information on all events, you can have a look at the Instagram account SICDBN or the Durban SICE Student Chapter account. And for more UKZN specific events, as well as information on the UKZN SICE Student Chapter Committee, such as how to join the UKZN Committee, Please follow and feel free to DM us on SICE underscore UKZN. This webinar will explain what SICE is about, how to become a student member, and will include a brief on the transport division. This webinar will be the first to an entire series of webinars where more specific information with regards to each event will be shared on the social media platforms, specifically Instagram at SICE underscore UKZN. Please feel free to type out any questions you have during this webinar in the chat box visible at the bottom of your screen. All questions will be answered towards the end of our session. I hope you're all able to take away some valuable information today. I would like to now hand you all over to Satna. Thanks, Mriti. Uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to our first webinar. Um, before I start, uh, we begin with the presentations, let me do an introduction of our speakers. Mr. Frederick Slappert is a professional engineer with 40 years of experience in the fields of transportation, water services planning, and the development of large infrastructure projects. He understands how to convert what to do to how to do. He obtained both his B.Eng. Civil and B.Eng. Honors Civil degrees from the University of Pretoria, with the latter in 1989. He commenced his engineering career with the former TPA Roads Department in 1981. In 1990, he joined Ullman, Vitas and Prince Consulting Engineers, now Marie Sphere Consulting, where he became a director in 1997. In 2013, he retired from UWP and in May 2015, established Science STEM Academy PTY Limited with Dr. Johan Bosman, who retired in 2020. He is the current chairperson of the SIC Transport Division. Ms. Erin De Silva is a candidate engineer and town planner that works at confluence of civil engineering and urban planning to improve cities and city regions. She obtained both her B.Eng. Civil and MTRP professional degrees from the University of Pretoria. Her work focuses on the efficiency and sustainability of cities by considering the impacts and changes required to transform these regions by analyzing transport systems, land use, climate change, social economic and demographic needs, and technology. She has just under three years of work experience within the fields of road and stormwater design, active mobility planning, transit oriented development, and social economic impact modeling. So over to you, speakers. Well, thank you very Thanks much. Erin, so uh, do you want to say a few words before I run and start sharing my screen? Oh, sure, yeah, I just think, uh, thank you very much for having us here today. Uh, we do look forward to a lot of interesting questions. Um, yeah, and uh, I look forward to the whole series and, you know, getting everybody excited about transport and uh, everything that it has to offer. Thank you very much. Uh, Sutna and Smriti, thank you very much for the introductions and uh, arranging this. It's really a pleasure for us to uh, share. Our division is quite active in most of the universities uh, through the work that Erin is doing uh, about, I think last week about, we've uh, had a presentation or session with the 
Wits University and a few other activities that we've had with UJ. And it's really uh, a pleasure to sharing some experiences. The first part of the presentation is really uh, focused on SICI. Now, the fact that you people have already established a committee there under the auspices uh, of SICI, and you call it SICI UKZN, all of those things, uh, I'm surprised that I actually need to share anything with you. But I am not shy of our institution. It's really um, adding value in the life of many people, not only in, at the student level, uh, even some older people like me without hair and uh, some of that is what is left has been turned gray already. But let's go and see, enjoy the ride with us. As you've said now that, uh, said now that we at the end of this presentation, I would prefer that we deal with questions on SICI first before we continue on the transport division and the activities that we are doing there. Thank you very much. So let's move on. So uh, is it sharing? Is it? Ah, there we go. A brief introduction. Welcome. Who are we? SICI, how to join the structures. I'm not going to deal with all of these matters you're going to see as we as the discussion unfolds. In terms of who we are, we've just been introduced, but I really want to thank Aaron as our student outreach portfolio leader that uh, really make all the contact with the universities and the student chapters. Indicated there, I'm the chairperson, I'm not gonna talk too much about it. Just going back to that, we are not shy of anything else that the SICE, in the Institute is doing, but we are also proud to be our own mouthpiece on transport. But as part of that, SICE as a voluntary association, it's really to do with the members, the people. It's not to do with clients, but we influence govern in various matters, but we are recognized by the Engineering Council, EXA, as a learned society. Learned society, just we are really in our field professionals. SICE has more than 10,000 paying members, not just as an illustration, uh, I will get to that. SICE do not ask students, once they've passed the first year, to uh, they can become members, but they don't need to pay. Um, and the more senior members, there's a, there's a subsidizing scale linked to that. Erin presented already the chat in a chat room. There are various links, but please dot this down, www.sice.org.za, and you will get all the information that I'm going to share tonight. You're going to find that there. Please visit the website. You can become, as already said, become a SICE member for free. I'm not gonna share this. This is just a screen from that, that part of the website where you can really, the point is there are various benefits of the queries. You can ask the detail, the contact numbers are there, benefits of the, mon the monthly magazine, but most importantly, you can get it for free. Now, any student that can get something for free, that is in my pocket. So I, I would say, join. You don't, it doesn't cost you, but you have benefits. Let's talk a bit about the benefits. Uh, just when I heard the introduction, I say, when you're a student, you, it's a very special period of your career. You build relationships. You maybe will have people around you with whom you've been in school, but now you're in the next level of your career development. You make new friends. You, you have great respect for these professors, these lecturers, these people with many, many years of experience and sharing their knowledge in a very formal way but the students have the opportunity to still enjoy themselves 
through the various student chapters. The application is, is done online. This was shared earlier as well, apply sci.org.za. The only thing you need to have is you need to have a picture. And if you have a picture, well, how do we make pictures, get pictures these days? You sit in front of your screen, computer screen, you print, uh, print screen, or you take your selfie and you send it through. You must have passed your first year. Then you become a member of SICE. The benefits of that is you get access to the book shop, the magazine, the various structures in, in the SICE organization. These are the branches in the same way that you uh, have your student branch. There are other branches, Durban, Marisburg, Zululand branches, regional uh, areas where they have regional events. But through the website, you get access to all the activities at the national office and matters related to, to that. But once you've finished your degree, you may not continue working in KwaZulu Natal. So you can start building relationships with areas on the Western Cape. Student chapter, make contact through with the student chapters in, in other provinces. Uh, start building relationships. I've always said to people, you're not going to live with your degree only. The strongest path into the future is the relationships that you create. And long-lasting relationships carry you through difficult times as well. Various sub-disciplines, specialist divisions. Uh, we are as transport, going to share some of um, what transport is all about. But you can see there, the main disciplines, water. Without water, we're dead. Without transport, the economy is dead. Without structural facilities, we can't get over deep gorges or have nice buildings to have lectures. Railway and harbor, without that, we can't export and import. Project management, we can't construct and manage projects properly. Marine, ICT, the ICE, fire engineering, environment, geotechnical, and I'm rushing through those, not that they are less important, but they are as important as the main, but you can see, for example, the environmental aspect is applicable in water and transport and railway, railway and marine engineering. So it's important that you differentiate with these smaller divisions compared to the more larger divisions. What happens at SICE National Office? They really have your needs at the for forefront. And you can see there, well, firstly, you need to know your SICE and all of these matters are available uh, through the website. These are the seven main focus areas ethics and diversity and inclusivity. I'm very glad to see the ladies are in the four, foreground, forefront here in, at UKZN. Then how do we share knowledge? But the most important part is how, to, how do we support our students? This is a SOS. And once they are graduated, then how do we grow them? How do we assist them to grow, to become an expert or a professional. All of these matters are available through the, web, the website and various activities. I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but this is the important one. SIC support our students. What is the purpose? To support students through tertiary education and prepare them for the workforce, including other life skills. As an example, uh, again, uh, the transport is taking some initiative there. Uh, about a month ago, we've had a workshop on how to prepare a CV. Because if you don't have a bursary where you are sure where you're going to work after you, you graduated, you would need to prepare a CV and send it to 
to various organizations and hope that you can get into a, a permanent position. So it's it's very important element. Strengthening the student chapters, and this is exactly what we are doing tonight. Uh, how do we assist, share information, share knowledge, uh, and assist even with advice from uh, other elements such as how to organize events, how can you assist students to build relationships and connections. Not to worry, I think I've mentioned about the branches and the divisions and how you can link to that. I'm not going to go through all of the others, but this is a very important link, the SICE Connect. For example, if you need a mentor, and that, that mentor is also related for students. We have found often that students are looking for holiday work, vacation work, part-time involvement. I know of many students that in their final year or so, they only have two or three modules to complete. So that is not taking full time, uh, uh, full of their time, uh, but therefore they may have a part-time position as a trainee student engineer at a company or something like that. And this is a place where you can post your availability and people see you because under SIC Connect, there are also mentors, people with lots of experience. They are not only retired people, they are also fairly senior individuals who are plowing their knowledge back and make themselves available for students. So in terms of um, another good example is topics to do your final year scripts uh, to do that. Uh, maybe this is a, a place where you can also post uh, or ask for ideas. Uh, recently, we've had a, a, a person who is doing a PhD in non-motorized transport, and we shared a lot of information related to that. So I think it's uh, important that you express your needs under the SICE Connect, and professionals will be able to connect with you there. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about grow a graduate. This is once you are graduate, then this is the time when you need to really be able to attend courses and practical work. And again, the important part of a graduate is to have a mentor. In our database, we've um, in a survey last year, we have found that there are about 300 smaller companies that are looking for mentorship. So you can see now from SICE Connect, in, even in the, into the graduate environment, there are young graduates that do not find appropriate mentorship. Why do we want mentorship? We want to become a professional engineer. And without being a professional, you are not going to climb ladder and you're not going to become the project leader. So that is important that this facility is available through Grow a Graduate. Um, grow SICE, I'm not going to talk too much about that and the network, grow an expert, even when you get to at the other end of the scale. We are saying but people need to continuously improve their qualification, their knowledge and experience through specific continued professional development courses, seminars, and the transport division is doing it specifically related to transport. Um, I'm not going to talk about that, but the important other element is the education and training aspect where you can look up what courses are available. And often we, uh, there they are special rates for students and for members and non-members. So it depends on, on the type of course, but that's uh, available to, to also see that. And then webinars, I think this is an area where young students can really get a feel for what is happening in the industry. Uh, that will, especially when you get to a more senior level at university that people start attending these webinars. Um, I would say 90% or more of these webinars are free uh, and having that free uh, helps you to get a feel of the types of questions 
that are happening in the in the industry and how you how you can apply that knowledge at the early stage the bookshop it's there you can buy whatever book you need uh, often there are uh, lower rates for for students uh, but it's there i think important follow SICE, uh, follow the various divisions on in the various social platforms and i think that is probably all i think you need to know uh, it is up to the individual often to go and click and learn and see and ask any questions satna thank you over to you erin you've probably uh, checked the q and a maybe you can assist there over to you people thank you very much uh, yeah, Frederick, we've got a, a request here, if you can just touch on a bit on GROW graduates, because there's some fourth years that are in, uh, in the webinar, and they just want to know a bit more about that. Sorry, Erin, I've uh, missed the question. Can you just repeat this a bit? Sure. Can you touch on GROW a graduate? Because uh, there's some fourth years in the, in the webinar, and they'd like to know that. GROW a graduate is the, the matter about... Uh, making sure that they have the relevant exposure in terms of getting to the professional registration. So graduate is up to, so up to point of grow a student, is the student years, but then from the time that you have your degree, that is when you start in the field of grow a graduate, where you may need a mentor, you may need advice in terms of the areas that you can work in or where there's a need for work. Uh, there are opportunities where there are uh, material, lecture material for further or specific courses for, although it mentioned even there on, this, on the website, continued professional development, that is even for under, uh, under professional people that they need to make sure that they have the various elements. There are, I think, 11 fields that you need to be exposed to in your career up to being a student to until you get to professional registration. And the first one of that is how to define a problem. And often young graduates have a, have a problem with that because what happens at varsity, there's an exam question it defines, it states the problem. It doesn't, and then you need to do a mathematical solution for that. In the real practical environment, you get to a stage where you need to assess a situation where you then need to be mentored through the process of doing the situation analysis, project defini uh, problem definition, evaluation of alternatives, implementing or um, suggesting an implementation program, uh, doing costing uh, processes. So that whole process um, they are, and the most important part is writing a report. The EXA requirement is very specific in terms of the various periods, times that you, you have. So each period, training period, that has a consistent, the work type is the same, the employer is the same, and your position is the same. So for each of those, you need to write a report. Uh, SICE has a PDP uh, department, a project development program, where number of people are they identified as mentors. As an example, uh, for a year uh, during 2019, I was allocated to the city of Tuane, where there were a number of young graduates in their 30s already. And because they were not a permanent transport specialist that can guide them in their field, I was pulled in to guide them through their professional registration process, through those steps of, in your experience, how do you get to a prob take that situation analysis. How do you do that? How do you define a problem? 
if you and and in many instances they were not projects so then we go into a situation we go to an intersection and we stand there and we ask questions how what do we see here and in some of my presentation we will we will go through some of those processes what do you see how do you do a cost estimate when you where, where do you get your information and if you don't have previous tender documents how do you go from to basic principles to obtain that information so that process is particularly important and grow a professional or grow a graduate um, and there's a whole team that uh, facilitates that process and they call on people with for example my experience and ask whether i can assist four or five graduates in a particular environment or in many other instances i've uh, especially in the more remote areas let's say uh, a place like polokwane they don't have so many people there or uh, opportunities so then a particular person in that region is identified and allocated to a graduate all right great uh, thank you frederick we've uh, got another question here um it deals with registering with exa as a candidate engineer uh so it's asking what is the acceptable time or when is the acceptable time to register as a candidate engineer with exa should we gather a few years of experience as new graduates prior to doing so or to try and register as soon as possible i think it relates exactly to my example that i've given now in terms of uh, a situ situation in in Twane. Uh, it's not only in in Twane that this happens and it is not a case of what is the shortest time it depends on the individual and the work environment and the types of projects they as you move through your career especially in the beginning right in the beginning you must be able to identify a problem as you move further you first let's say in the first few months you may only observe you work next to a professional you see what they are doing so there's a very specific process that exa requires you have to do problem identity or your problem identification I don't have that sheet in front of me. I can probably stand up and go and fetch it in the, in my my filing, but it's a two-page leaflet. So what I'm going to do, Erin, is I'm going to scan that document, and I'm going to share that because it summarizes the activities that we need to do, and it, the activities doesn't uh, do not deal with water or transport or structures. It deals with the responsibility level. So first you ob observe, and as you grow experience, you become self-sustainable. You can write the report on your own with your, through the whole process. So it's the various levels of responsibility, but it's also in the horizontal side, it is the types of things that you're doing. Problem identification, evaluation of uh, alternatives, doing cost estimates making recommendations all of those matters you need to need to do um, so it's responsibility and a range of activities I, I will scan that document uh, maybe i have it electronically uh, and then uh, you can share it with the with the members here in kzd thank you yeah i think um i'll just add a bit um onto that as well uh in terms of being a candidate engineer, um, so to practice engineering in this country, you have to actually be registered with the Engineering Council of South Africa. So um, you should register as a candidate as soon as you can. So what EXA generally does is that uh, when you finish um, your course, um, I'm not sure what the different universities, but they generally give you a letter stating, you know, this is when you are going to graduate and this is your graduation ceremony. And that, along with your academic record, you can actually give that to EXA. And what they'll do is they'll give you a candidate um, certificate, and then they just require you to send in your um, actual graduation certificate once you're done. But an employer will not actually allow you to 
undertake any engineering work within this country if you're not registered with AXA. Um, so the difference between professional and candidate, um, that is what Frederick was saying, where a professional can work um, on their own accord uh, because they've obviously proven that they're responsible uh, practitioners to do so, whereas a candidate will work under a professional, um, but it's still essential that you do register as soon as possible. Okay. Um, Frederick, I see we've got one more question just before you head on. Um, it says, if I have a diploma and I'm working towards obtaining a B Eng in civil engineering, is it a must for me to register at EXA as a technician candidate now, or should I wait to obtain my B Eng and be able to register as a technologist candidate? I must uh, say on, on, on this topic, uh, I'm an assessor at EXA as well. And our most recent um, workshop that we've had was to explain the whole process with uh, in the curricula what happens with students that arrive with a BTEC and some of them want to do or move into the uh, B engineering and all of those processes. If the individual is doing a is planning to finalize the B engineering degree, I would say rather wait with that because then the assessment process is a little bit different. And, but you, you, you may register or become a professional technologist earlier if you have that experience, it's, it's practically possible. Uh, and then for whatever reason, I know of a number of people that became professional technologists and only then decided that they want to do their degree and then they they don't need to do all the modules from first year again they continue at a certain level depending on what they they have and then they go and become a professional engineer so it it really depends on on the individual my advice would be generally if you are in final year or uh, third year, I would suggest that you do your uh, B engineer and complete that in, and follow the program for professional registration uh, on uh, the engineering route rather than the B tech route. That's my, that would be my personal advice. Other people may suggest otherwise, but um, uh, I have just seen that in the end uh, it, it is a higher qualification. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Okay, perfect. I don't see any other questions coming through. Uh, so do you want to carry on with the uh, transport presentation? And if there's any, we can just come back. Fine, I'll, I'll do that. Let me just uh, start sharing that screen. And uh, before I do that, um, I'm just going to use uh, a presentation, a fairly general presentation of various projects in terms of transport, rather than talking about what the transport division is doing. May I just as an introduction say, all of these activities that we've had, of what SICE is doing, all of those elements, the transport division does that as well, because we have a student chapter with, for example, Aaron leading that. We have a portfolio on courses, how we develop. We are very close in announcing nine new transport courses, specifically for the level of people at the graduate level or young professionals with three or four years professional experience, but not having their exposure yet. And by attending these introductory and fundamental courses, they will then be, of course, have more knowledge than those who didn't attend that, and they will be able to get work exposure in those fields. It also, we have uh, had a discussions with a number of universities already, that that would lead, assist the universities to um, allow the students with, uh, as a uh, prior uh, recognized learning or recognized prior learning where they can then uh, on the basis of that those courses that SICE is going to offer through the transport division then do a master's in a specific field 
in transport that leads into a lot of more opportunities for, for the individual. So I'm going to deal with what is contained all in, in transport and how the individuals then can say, but I would like to know more about that. And I recall that we've said we're going to give an introduction tonight. And then out of our Q&A, maybe we can build up a, a survey, a quick survey, where people vote for three specific topics in this transport field. And then those could be the first three items that we come back with uh, more detailed discussions. So I really want to give you a big picture of what is available and what is driving transport in general. Fine, so let me just get that presentation on. And that is now there. And if you can see that, you must just say that you can see that. Erin, is that up? Yeah. Fine. Uh, CNM Academy is, is, that's where I live on my daily life. But uh, we are, that is, as I'm saying, it is for and on behalf of the transport division. We're going to just briefly talk about the basic definition of transport, and the examples of infrastructures and its importance, and then examples of transport services. It's important that we uh, differentiate between infrastructure and services. I think at the university level, we basically only get exposure mostly on the infrastructure side. But this is where under the grow a graduate, we expose youngsters in terms of the transport service and its importance. And then I will just summarize on in terms of what is the focus of, of transport. Now, trans the definition of transport, the most basic, is really transport infrastructure. And you can see that roads are there, freeways, but it's not only roads, it's also railway lines. It will be pipelines, gas to be transported, fuel, non-motorized transport, that is for cyclists. Where, where can they cycle safely? So all of those elements in the infrastructure element, but just on that picture, it is the transport engineer that decides that we need to have an interchange. And then it opens the door for structures, which is part of the infrastructure development. Services is the matter of taxis. This picture illustrates all the public transport services. It's a multimodal interchange. There are other taxi facilities on that side and on there in the background, there's a rail service. So where people move. So services deal with this service offering. But may, may we share some new items under services. Have you ever heard about e-hailing? These people from checkers that deliver in 60 minutes or the Mr. D, those are services. Courier services, people delivering, those are all transport services that need to be catered for. In some areas, because of the COVID situation, lots of people aren't going to shops anymore, but they still need to have their goods delivered. And that is where the e-hailing element comes in. That is why do we need that? Because we need to move people from from very small to worker people from the place of work and we need to move also goods when we look at that goods from where you live to where you work in terms of people in place in terms of goods from the place of manufacturing to the place where it's required so it may be concrete to the site where bridge is built, or it may be a goods like agricultural goods that are exported. Uh, coal, the mine or gold or 
those those items need to get to another place where it's purified so all of those matters so that is the point so the most basic definition is transport infrastructure and services to move people and goods from a to b i'm going to get back to this just uh, close closer to the end now the infrastructure element i think i've shared some of that is how do you cross deep valleys let's talk about that a bit you can see there there's a, an example of the blowcrans bridge now somebody decided and that is the transport engineer that the best thing to do is to get from this side to that side and how do we do that so it is a bridge to be built the bridge is a structural element and it not necessarily the main focus of the transport but it's an enabler it's an enabler it makes economic sense so this is the final product it was built in 1984 260 meters meters high and the span is 272 meters and some of you may even know that that is the place where you do bungee jumping the Blokrans Arch Bridge is the highest in the continent of Africa, with a deck of 260 meters above the gorge. It's located on the N2 Garden Route, two-lane route, and there's several other spectacular high concrete arch, arch bridges. The Van Staden Storms River, Groot River, Bobbiaans River. And at the time, this was the only highway in the world outside of China, on Italy, where there were three bridges of that height higher than 152 meters when it opened in 1984 it also held the record for the world's highest concrete arch bridge now you can say no okay so you talk about a structural bridge but let's look at the economic value of that and that is where transport engineering comes in in the there's the bridge Prior to this bridge being built, exactly over there, vehicles had to travel through this, along this route. And you can see it is twisting and turning. So what, has, what happens here? Trucks are moving extremely slow. If trucks move slow, it costs a lot of money. If they move slow, it takes a long time for goods to move from A to B. The less goods that are moved, the lower the growth in economy. Now, the moment this bridge, so that is the dilemma that the transport engineer is faced with. So how do we make this shorter? Ultimately, whole investigation, a route determination defines that that is the new route. And then the problem definition. You hear in terms of the professional registration, what is the need here? The need is to identify the problem. Well, before this road was there, everyone could identify the problem. Slow moving traffic. Sometimes some areas may be unsafe. Uh, it is expensive for the goods to be moved. So the quicker it gets to the other side, the more economical it is for the manufacturer and the better for the consumer. Now that the bridge is there, so the travel time from, instead of going along there versus that, reduced to about 20% of the original travel time. Time is money. So that is important element to find a solution to the problem. Similarly, you get to very high mountains and maybe it's better to go through the mountain the huguenot tunnel was done built design in 1984 as well i think it was 84 maybe 87 and we'll get to the details now and also here was a, a very steep mountain pass of the pass was something like 36 kilometers long the tunnel is only 3.9 kilometers long. So in here, you have to be part of a team that do geotechnical investigation. 
all these drilling and soil mechanics and soil tests that you do at the lab, all of those, but they are more sophisticated rock mechanics and those and understanding the geology, those third year modules that we don't like so much uh, with all these names. Uh, this is why you need to know that. Uh, so that's not included just for the love of the, 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 the module, it's uh, important. It is the alternative to the Tuist Cliff Pass due to the traffic increase. Now, why did the traffic increase? There was a, a promulgation of a, a removal of that freight does not need to be hauled between A and B through using rail. And then trucks start moving along the roads. And the same in, in, in the area of KZN, I received a little booklet prepared by Malcolm Mitchell uh, due to our involvement in that, in terms of the growth of the N3. And you all grew up with the N3 being uh, basically a freeway. In, it's 160 years old now. In the first years of the N3, it was not called the N3. It was a single road commuting or bringing freight between the Durban Harbour and Gauteng or exporting products manufactured in Gauteng back to Durban. And as the vehicles or the volumes increased, vehicle sizes increase. But if the geometry of a road doesn't allow that, you need to stick to smaller vehicles so that happened in 1970 and then the whole planning started of this tunnel and it construction only started in 84 so you can see from the start that there was a definition of the problem it took 11 years to find the final solution through cost estimates alternative evaluation and then today even there's some technology added in a tunnel. 34 tunnels, uh, cameras, check that uh, if there's an, an accident, uh, etc., and keep it safe. Example here again, you can see from this point where they joined the N1 and the old road from there going over the pass, the Tuist Kloof Pass until they join again. That is 36 Ks. And from this point, through the tunnel to the same point is only 16 Ks. Immediately, you have again a saving. Now, all of these planning, what should be done? That is part of the transport engineer's job. And then once the solution is defined, it is the, the geotechnical investigation, tunnel experts, all of those people that are brought in to find the best uh, location for the tunnel. Just to illustrate from that point over there, you can see how twisty and turny it is. It's 13 and a half case from the bottom to the top, and then another 13 and a half case, and then there are still other parts that you need to link, a grade of 8%, but the most important obstacle is the sharp bends on the route, and you can see it's just a difference of easy flowing going right through in terms of the geometric design. What is also important in terms of transport is to connect cities. Uh, Cape Town to be connected to George, Port Elizabeth, Cape Town to be connected to Johannesburg, Durban, exactly example that I've shared now, Job, uh, Durban to be connected to Joburg, Joburg to be connected to Pretoria as an example. So. I'm using the Ben Skuman as a, a freeway as an example, but there are other similar important freeways. You may not have been exposed to all the discussions about the Ben Skuman and the e toll situation. The important part here is that through the N3 uh, activities early years, the whole principle of toll tolling a road became uh, agreed in Parliament for the simple reason is that 
government realized that they have other priorities as well. And roads are not the only priority. And although it is important for the economy, the user pay principle got established. And here we, uh, the transport engineers uh, calculated what need to be done and the toll fee is calculated. And the, the, up there are numerous cameras. We use high tech technology. And although it's interesting here that although the speed limit is 120 on the freeway, and some people will say, well, the camera can't see me. Uh, if I drive fast enough or close enough, between two cars close enough to each other, the cameras are so sensitive that they, although two cars are really driving back to back of each other, the camera at 160 k's an hour, the cameras can still pick up the disk numbers and pick up the driver details from that. Uh, in the in the discs and or the license plate, so high tech technology, but important, all the technology and the infrastructure required to build a facility like that. It's been it started in 1968 with only a normal two lane freeway in two four lane two lanes in a direction. In 2005, there was already 160 thousand vehicles in a day but it's today the busiest road in the country. What is a point that I'm making about all of these examples? That transport infrastructure is an enabler of the economic growth of a country. It's like health infrastructure is ensuring the health of the population. You can see that, that the one can't go without the other. So infrastructure is extremely important. And you will notice, if you drive around, look around, at, at interchanges, you will always see that there's a densification of industries or business development or housing development because it improves access to the economy in an easier way. Let me continue to, sorry, I don't want to do that. Let, let us go to serve and just talk about services. Services is really the important matter of connecting the place of living to the place of work, or as I've used earlier, is connecting needs of people. For, um, the example earlier, let's talk about Uber. Uber is also a service. It's connecting people from where they are to where they want to be. It doesn't need to be place of work. It's a place of where you are to where you want to be. And all of these services need to be provided for. And in terms of the infrastructure part, they need to be space for these things. I'll show you a few important uh, examples. So connecting people to place of work, here's uh, an example. And in, in KZN, uh, there's uh, also a, a very important development in Durban with the uh, GO Metro situation there where, where infrastructure is provided, stations like, like these in Johannesburg and a bus service is provided on the main corridors to bring people not only to the place of work because you can use this facility to get from A to B, uh, moving between stations, get on and be have access to the shopping center from your place of work. Uh, the whole design of stations, how they look, uh, whether it is a station like this on the side of the road or maybe one of these uh, similar to the example where we have stations in the median and you have boarding there and it need to be quite safe. The important of this is, and this is often an element that is not covered at all at uh, undergraduate level, where we need to 
st sharing a very important element of how cities are developed. And Erin shared uh, her early experience already where she's involved with the town planning and the transit opportunities and corridors and how the towns and cities need to develop along corridors to bring people closer to and easier to the place of work, to place of need and work or social interaction. It improved connections between different destinations within the corridor. So you don't need to travel only from the start to the end. You can get on and off as you need to do. But the most important part, and I, I share it every time, is growth of the economy and commercial nodes. The densification of bringing people closer from where they live to where they where the employment opportunities are. And it's important that we move people safely and quickly from where they want to be and encourage other facilities cycling uh, alongside public transport. But most important, it's important to have it safe, comfortable and inviting. So you shouldn't be scared to use it as to put it as simple as that. Here we, we look at our some people call, call this our enemy. Well, at least 26% of the population use minibus taxi facility as a service. And this is a critical element of the economy. And if people can't get from where they are to where they want to be, then and we take this out of the system, then we need to, well, the economy is gonna, we will have more poor people and the economy will grow less. So it's important that we uh, acknowledge the need for the minibus taxi service uh, in the whole public transport environment. It's also important in the rural connections to consider how people move. Here's an example. Uh, it's there in Utungulu, more in your part of the world, where you have Richards Bay as an industrial hub what does industrial hub mean? Many, many job opportunities. People don't live close by, they live on the edges. And then we do various investigations to identify which are the main corridors and they are indicated in blue and the less important corridors are identified in red and you will have different facilities on different corridors. So all of these matters are part of the transport engineer, we call it land use and transport planning integration, that you connect people from where they are to where they want to be. And here's Empangeni, it's also an important town in the area, Ishawi, lots of, in, uh, not that big industrial, but there are some industrial activities happening there. Uh, and, and this is part of the work of a transport engineer in terms of the planning, land use integration. Connecting place of living, place of work, in the deep rural areas, we really need to consider how people bring their goods to the market. Um, what opportunities are there? Uh, what do we do with scholars? Here's an example of a presentation of how scholar transport policy, sh policy should be developed and implemented. This is all part of services. And here's an, another example of an implementation guide to develop the rural transport strategy into implementation. It's no use that there's a, a policy or strategy, they need to be implementation as well. But important, services need to be safe. Here's an example of a non-motorized corridor between Here's a main bus station and there's a main taxi rank. How do we get people from this point to this point? They're gonna walk. So this was the original proposal that I'm sharing here. And um, when we started to look at this, my suggestion ultimately was this whole area should be a pedestrian uh, mall and people get access. And the where do people park? 
well, if the public transport services are strong enough, this short area can be walked and you get directly to the public, uh, the taxi rank on that side and the more formal bus services that will distribute you to wherever you need to be. Uh, ultimately, there was a link built around there and another link coming into the this, this city over there, but there's a middle part that didn't fall into that. So that's important, but you can see the important part of sidewalks. So we as engineers sit and we debate, uh, what do we do? Do we have trees there or do we really provide for the safety by removing cars out of this area? This is a Siabua non-motorized transport intersection in Tokyo. It is the busiest pedestrian crossing in the world. This picture was taken uh, about half past 10 in the evening. The public transport, the rail system is extremely strong there. So people are getting off uh, the train. They either need to get a bus and, but they need to wait until it is safe. And then when the light goes green, the pedestrians have total control over the intersection. And you see how it looks at this time of the evening and the bus waits and the, all the other activities in the design are considered. How people walk, you can see it's marked there uh, clearly for the uh, universal access for uh, visually impaired people, uh, safety on the, how they get there, no, no st steps, ramps for people to go up. But this is, these are all types of uh, planning and design that happens by the engineers. Safety aspects in design. Here's another example that I've found is that you can see here's a station and the very number of vehicle turning. Some go straight, you put in your drainage and all of those facilities. And here's a pedestrian sidewalk. At, up to this point, then you cross, you either go into the, the bus or you cross and you walk along there. What is a big problem here? Look at it, people coming along here. And how do they, what do they do there? They want to go across. So here is a, is a design flaw, if you can see that. So sometimes we, we should be really be aware of the design elements that we consider and that we allow people to walk. If you provide a sidewalk like this, don't say they will never walk there. Provide for that in your design. Mobility is a, another area where various options uh, in the area, there are various nodes identified in terms of town planning, where you then need to say, how do these people get there? And what types of mode of transport you need to co consider? Is it a, a formal public transport system like in buses, uh, routes, it doesn't need to be like a BRT situation, but these matters need to be considered. What is the focus of transport? It's as simple as when you do a bridge design. They say, and you all do that, uh, you calculate the load for a concrete slab for a, in, in a roof, a uh, house or double story, and you calculate the load. But in transport, we, calc we determine the number of vehicles and the type of vehicles. Heavy vehicles carry different loads than light vehicles. And in other instances, like that example in Tokyo, you need to know the number of people and how they want to move. Once you know that, let's go back to the bridge. If we, once you know what the definition is of your problem, then you determine the solution. It's a highway or tunnel or bus service or taxi service or rural transport or even non-motorized transport example. Determine the best route. You remember the pictures about the steep uh, grades at the Huguenot Tunnel? How do you cross that? Uh, determine your cross section, how wide, how many lanes. Uh, all of those are calculations that you do as an transport or traffic or transport engineer. 
you then determine the road or street or sideway, sidewalk or pavement structures. But always you need to consider the safety of, of people, life cycle costing. Uh, what type of material do you use? Um, how do you deal, assist people with disabilities? All of these matters are important in transport. Transport sustainability, I can just summarize. Yeah, is the matter, yeah, is a definition. And we all grew up with puzzles. Where we say, and I say, these are the four corners of the transport business. It's transport is a provision of infrastructure and services to assist the movement of people and goods from A to B. And if we now continue, then you will see that there are other important aspects in, related to that. Who is doing that? It is the some transport authority. They need to be legislation and policy. And where is the money coming from? You remember my discussion about e-tolls. Uh, but if, if we're not getting it from e-tolls, where do we get the money from? So it's important to consider all of those in the transport authority. Then there are human resources and land use. If we don't have properly trained people in the transport authority, who will maintain the road? Who will maintain the water services infrastructure? All of those matter. We need to consider land use, especially in an urban environment. We need to consider the environment. You can see that. We need to consider energy and technology. The example of the Ben Skumon traffic data uh, technology in the tunnel. Uh, how do you monitor what is happening? All of these are elements in the project. But you have to consider safety, security, social inclusion, marketing and communication. And all of this leads to the economic growth, mobility of people, faster moving, moving of goods. There's an increased quality of life. And we as engineers has a, have the responsibility to ensure that it is sustainable. Now, all of these find its way in some of the courses that we as the transport division are developing. Uh, spare nine new modules that will be uh, available from around about September this year to ensure that young graduates and even young professionals have the required skills to become a full transport specialist. Now, how do we link these things? Because environment has an impact on land use, uh, quality of life, energy. So then I sat one day and I said, well, let me just draw some arrows. So what are linked to each other? And you can see here, yeah, that transport is not only the building of a road or the design of a road and the building of a road. You need to consider where the environment, uh, technology, what techn technology can you use? What information do you need to have? How do you improve quality of life? What can, if we build that road, what would be the economy, uh, economic growth in that area? What would be the social impact? So those are the matters that is that are critically important for the transport engineer, not only the infrastructure element, because if we only have infrastructure and not considering why we need it, what services we can offer with that, how do we serve people and how do we get goods from where they are manufactured or where they come out of the, the ground in a mine, how do we export that material? Uh, or how do we get them to an industry where they can uh, manufacture other uh, items with that. So th this is a real integrated process, and that is the benefit of transport that not all of these others, other disciplines have. Although water, for example, uh, has also, it's not a, a transport authority, but it's a water authority. They are also policy regulations of financial. They need to have the resources. They need to consider how we are bringing water from where it is to where the people are living. We need to consider the environment. We need to consider how much we pump all of this water. So you can see, so this diagram is quite applicable to many of the other disciplines as well. Lastly, I can just say that the transport engineer often becomes a project leader of an engineering team. 
You can see why. Because we connect people and places of work and the economy and places of living with each other. Uh, and without that, we can't really get to the point where we have a better quality of life. So that is what I think young engineers should focus on. I'm not belittling any of the others, but I'm saying focus and get your career in transport. And please have a look at our own transport website. Our division has developed a very, very interactive website with the help of Erin, and we are guiding, providing some guidance there. But on this website, there are summaries of previous webinars. There are links to important authorities like Sunra or uh, CSIR, and you can click there and you can get access to important design guidelines, for example, Sunrall's information. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that is what I suggest you do. And out of this, we now need to say, uh, or that we don't need to do it now, but you can decide at the next month which two elements or three elements, but you can see if we if we start start talking about these things, we can really get excited about the various elements. And each of these elements for example, the infrastructure, the geometric design, the pavement assessment, land use considerations in spatial planning, all of those elements, um, not often are those uh, shared at the uh, undergraduate level. And that's not a, a finger pointing, it's just a fact because it's a, a bit more advanced, but the infrastructure element, materials investigation, it is a building block phase of, of undergraduate, but then it's important at the grad after graduation to attend these to these other courses that are being offered. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Slabek, uh, for that. Um, before we go to questions, if there's any, I'm going to launch a poll. Please could everyone respond so we get a better idea of what we should prepare for the next webinar. Um, and if you could just let me know if it's launching. It's there. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So, uh, will you will you explain to to some of the people how how to make the poll? How do you? How do you uh, yeah. How so, do you so basically, you just click on the option that you. Uh, that would answer your quest the question best. Um, uh, yeah, I can see people have started voting. Good. Okay, Aaron, I think we're looking at uh, a webinar on traffic engineering next. Well, it's a it's a tight <laughs> race between pavements okay, yeah. <laughs> and traffic. Uh, it's uh, it's fantastic and uh, very exciting. If you voted and there's any questions, could you please uh, put it in the chat so we could answer it? Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, I'm assuming the two people that haven't voted is me and Aaron or Frederick. Oh, Frederick. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. I'll just leave it for a few minutes. It's overwhelming uh, in the area of while well, you get to 68, two thirds are going for traffic engineering and pavement and geometric. And I must say, those are the fundamental areas. 
if you can't do the proper traffic counts and what do you how do you do that and understand the load as per my my previous discussion then you will lead that will lead into pavement and geometric traffic engineering has two components it's a cars and the trucks and they are counted in different ways it's quite important to realize that but traffic engineering deals with the load and then the next element is how wide because the geometry gives you less congestion on safety and pavement gives you a smooth and safe ride without potholes if it can be maintained so those are quite important matters okay um i'm going to end the poll now i think it's just me that hasn't voted so thank you everyone for partaking in that i'll just i can share the results with you guys um are there any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Oh, I don't think there's any. Okay. Okay, then um, <clears throat> with that, I'd just like to conclude. Um, the UKZNCIC student chapter would like to place on record its gratitude to the following people that have helped make this event a success. So to our esteemed speakers, Mr. Frederick Slavert and Ms. Erin De Silva, thank you for helping us understand SICE's importance and giving us an overview of the transport division. We look forward to hearing more about the transport sector in the upcoming webinars. And I think from the poll, that's evident. Um, secondly, to the UKZN staff members, Prof. Everett, Dr. McLeod and Mrs. Chetty for their advice and technical assistance. Ms. Erin De Silva in a non-speaker role this time for helping to plan and coordinate this event on behalf of the SIC Transport Division and providing guidance when necessary. And finally, you, the audience. Thank you for attending this webinar. We hope that it has been beneficial to you and we look forward to seeing you in the upcoming ones that will be tailored to your requests. That concludes our event for the evening. On behalf of the SICE Transport Division and the UKZN SICE Student Chapter, we hope that we've enlightened you on SICE and the Transport Division. Please follow the Instagram and LinkedIn pages for information on our next webinars. Thank you and good evening. Last word, thank you very much, Sadna, for arranging. Prof Everett, I see your face there in the background. Thank you for supporting the students. Uh, it's important, you guys are not there just for nothing. You guys are there to mentor and at the undergraduate, it's, it's, where, it's there where they get formed. Thank you very much, Prof, for your involvement there. Thank you very much, everyone. Smithy and Sadna, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, thank good you night. All.